get started. <laughs>
question in Genesis 32, the question in Judges 13, Proverbs, uh, what is it, Proverbs 30, verse 4, uh, what is Proverbs 30, verse 4?
had the opportunity to read the paper on this name that I posted this week. Excellent. Uh, there are a lot of people in the Messianic community who want to call him Yahshua, Yahushua. There's all different, there's some wacky variations of it. I mean, those two are rather benign, but there are some wacky variations of it. Thinking that because he is Yahweh in the flesh, that his name has to have the name Yahweh in it. No, it doesn't. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> And so if you're, if you're stumbling over the pronunciation the way we pronounce it, which is plain and simple, Yeshua, go read that document and there's 30 verses of scriptural proof as to why it's pronounced simply as Yeshua, as well as the fact that he is called Yahweh, Yeshua HaMashiach, by the apostles over and over. So there's no need to try to stuff Yahweh into this name. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? Okay, so Yeshua means salvation. So when you call him by his old his whole title, Yahweh, the Messiah, the anointed one, is salvation. He is Yeshua. Yahweh is Yeshua. You could say it the other way. Salvation is Yahweh, the anointed one. So when you stick his, his whole title together that they preached, you have Yahweh in the midst of that. So you don't need to stuff it into this one word. Okay, so that basically is what that document says, but it gives you Tons of script, scriptural references that prove why we pronounce it as Yeshua. Uh, so, here is this verse, this blessing over Don, and he's called a serpent. And he, he says that he will judge the people. And years ago, I taught this series on teaching the book of Revelation from the Tanakh, kind of like we're doing now. We looked in the Tanakh to, to look for all the tools to be able to interpret the book of Revelation. And then, Lance, you were there for that, weren't you? And at the end of it, we took about two weeks to read the book of Revelation, and it just unfolded. Okay. Uh, so, where was that going? So in that study, we had, uh, we ran across the concept of anti-Messiah, and you can't help but get across that subject because of what we were studying. So uh, we posited a theory, if you will, that the anti-Messiah would come from the tribe of Dan. It's certainly possible, and there's a reason that this scripture is in here, okay? Now, I have learned, you know, I, I don't stop studying, so I've learned things since then that do not necessarily overturn that theory, but make it a little more complex. And that is the location of that tribe. Because there, is, there seems to have been some evidence that they, they were up in Greece. Josephus actually tells us that the Jews of the first century believed that the Spartans were tribe of Dan. So that was common understanding in the first century. Now, the modern Jews are looking at Ethiopia and saying that Ethiopia is the tribe of Dan. It doesn't mean they could have gone both ways. Well, remember that the tribe of Dan was split its inheritance within the land of Israel. They had two portions. That's right. And that, that, that's what I was about to get to is that they could have gone in two different directions Precisely because of that reason. And they could have done it at different times. There was a, there, there's a verse somewhere in the Tanakh that basically says that Dan was adventurous and went out on the ships. Uh, there's there is a, a, a part of Israel that actually left and did not go in the Exodus. They went another way. And they believe that that's the Danites. So uh, the Spartans had a legend that they were Jewish. And the Jews, in the time of Messiah, when Josephus was there and he recorded history, they agreed. So there's documents on both sides that basically uh, conclude back then that Dan, you know, that the Spartans were the tribe of Dan. Uh, when you consider that it was the Greeks who came down 
and committed the abomination of desolation the first time with Antiochus Epiphanes, then you start to think, okay, there might be something to this because they did judge the people and bite them like a serpent and, and commit the abomination of desolation. It was a Greek commander who stood in the temple and declared himself to be Zeus and declared himself to be Yahweh and offered a pig on the altar and committed the abomination of desolation that Daniel predicted the first time. Obviously, Yeshua is telling us it's going to happen again because he predicted it in, in the future from when he was here. He said, when you see in the future the abomination of desolation. So it already happened once and it was done by a Greek. So that's why I suspect that it's possible that whoever stands up as a savior to Israel, a false savior, if you will, Shekhar Hamashiach, the lying Messiah, could be someone from uh, Greece. And so, if you look at the, if you look at the <coughs> European Union and Greece's history in that, then it does seem a little bizarre because now Greece is leading the other way. They've been, they've gone out of the European Union or are about to. I can't remember. I think they might have got kicked out or withdrew, but they're out now. And they were the tenth one to go into that union, which is bizarre because the, the, the anti-Messiah is supposed to come out of the tenth nation, right? Uh, so so I, I believe that there's two things going on here in regard to those prophecies. But what I want to look at here is this last line says, Yeshua Kecha Kiviti Yahweh. I, when I read it this week, I was like, it was almost like I'm waiting for your Yeshua. You know what I'm saying? Not hoping for him in the sense of, because Kibiki means, means I'm waiting, and, and it does kind of, but it's an anticipation more than it is a hope, if you understand what I'm saying. It's almost like I dare you to show up. Because that's what pride is. And of course, we know that the anti-Messiah will stand, he will be in Jerusalem when Yeshua comes back, trying to conquer it trying to squeeze out these Jewish people, people who now believe in Messiah because of his abomination. And they go, oh, hey, hey, he's not the Messiah. And now they convert and they believe in the guy that these two prophets were preaching. And so he's trying to squeeze them out and kill them because now they believe in Yeshua and they won't bend to his will. And of course, Messiah comes back at that point and he binds him up and casts him out. Okay. So I think there's something to this. We don't have, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But in the middle of that word, Li Yeshua Teha, of course, you see, you see Yeshua. I wait for your salvation, O Yahweh. And right after <coughs> is the name. I wait for your salvation, Yahweh. So when you consider that Hebrew was not written with commas and punctuation, all we're getting is, a, is opinion about how to put it in English, really. And it's good. It's good opinion. It is a good way to look at it. Uh, let, me, let me look at it. So I'm way down, it's like 2,200. So I 
thought that maybe it was uh, Simeonites who left Cardinal Moses and went to Greece. Oh, yeah? I'd never heard that. Uh, but the, the theory that I had was that they weren't, they left before the, the counting in numbers had taken place anyway the Danites had. I'm not saying that the Simeonites couldn't have left, but uh, if I remember my chronology, they left right before the Exodus. They didn't even go with them. Uh, and the evidence in Greece points to the Danites somehow. I can't remember. There is a there is a anybody watch that video series that we did and have this fresh in your memory by chance? Uh, because there is a there's an archaeological site over there that seems to imply that, that it was the Danites there. Um, it didn't say a lot. Yeah. So and the letter is going back and forth between Josephus. Have you read that recently? It does he does say Dan, doesn't he? I've done a little bit more radiant leaning towards Simeon. Okay. Even the letter on their shield in the Greek language goes back to their mother or to something like that. It's been a long time. Yeah. Okay. It's like I said, it's a complicated thing and there's no way to prove it. Uh, <coughs> uh, but that is interesting that Simeon's numbers go down. Yeah. I have a question about on, on the Yeshua T. What's the context of the text around it in trying to figure out what they are actually saying? Is it hopeful? Is it condemnatious? Is it. Well, it, what's around it is a lobbying. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the word specifically. I'm talking about the surrounding text, trying to figure out how to make it. Well, I thought I'd explain that, or at least my opinion. Well, like the text before that, is it. I'm, they're separate little stanzas. They're separate little prophecies for each of the brothers. Oh, I see. Okay, so, uh, and, and it's, you know, I don't mean to get us off in a big rabbit trail. It was just something curious that I saw. Uh, but nonetheless, you see sort of a foreshadowing here in Israel's future. And I just think it's an odd statement. I wait for you or Yeshua. Yeah. I think it's out of place and odd. And so I'm just giving you one idea about what I think it could be pointing at. I'm not saying that that's what it is. I'm giving you an idea to think about. Right. Okay, so, but it's not something I'm prepared to dwell on and just, you know, beat to death tonight. Uh, um, there's a group in Israel that gets stuff on email all the time. And one of the scriptures they were alluding to, this is maybe probably a year ago, that they said something. And you were quoting a scripture, I don't remember what a scripture was, but it said that God placed his name on the Temple Mount. And they had uh, aerial photography, uh, or satellite photography, I don't know what it was. And it was very clearly the letter Sheen that was imposed on the Temple Mount. Okay? The second letter there was Sheen, right? That's a Sheen, yeah. And you his name? Well, if that's indeed the case, if he imposed his name on the temple now and he somehow values Sheen as the force of his name and then here we have Yeshua and the second letter of Yeshua's name is Sheen. Seems to be a perfect match. Or maybe I'm just uh, prophesizing too far. Well, well, Sheen, the Sheen, Sheen is actually made up of valleys that surround Mount Moriah or at least in the area. Yeah. What they, what they showed the aerial picture of was clearly a sheen. I mean, there's no way of around it. It's real hard. Right, but the significance of it is that as you look at it from the air, the, the, the relative location of the temple uh, is associated with the bow arm. And I can't remember if it's that, I guess, or another one, but um, it's, it's the bow mark that makes it Significant. Well, the letter is significant because that's that's the first letter in Shaddai. I was just trying to draw a correlation. If that's what he imposed on the temple now. Uh, well, I think the big, I think the biggest significance about that, him saying he will write his name in the earth, is the fact that when Yeshua died on a stake, which this would be a tree to me, but nonetheless there is a an 
ancient Tav in there. Okay? And that means signature. And Yeshua shed his blood into the earth there. And do you know relative to this letter where the actual because you've been there and I know you've been I, there. I thought it was kind of like what you're, you're describing right there. You've got the kid on and then yeah, so I think that it's, I, I think that the, the place of his execution is actually more significant to, to that line of thinking, okay? And I think it's more relative to uh, the sheet and the Shaddai. But it's relative to the dot, not so much the letter. The letter is there, you can visibly see it. If you look at Israel, at Jerusalem, you can see the sheen, yes. But it's the location of the accent mark that makes it Shaddai, that makes it so significant. And the fact that it's a signature that he died on a stake that looked, looked like a Tav, an ancient Tav, the ancient one, which means signature. And of course, he said, I'm writing my name in the earth. So I believe that he wrote it. He had to have all of it in order for it to be Shaddai or to represent his name. And of course, yes, the fact that that letter is in Yeshua and not in Yahweh is significant.
chapter says that Yahweh is my rock. He's the rock of my he's the rock of my issue. My rock that follows them. And as Corinthians tells us that the rock that followed them was Mashiach. And that's what we're trying to get at here is that Moshe here in verse 14 in, in chapter 14 is telling them, stand still and see the Yeshua. And what the thing that I want you to get at for the purpose of our study, for showing Jewish people, is that you want to show them that Yeshua's name is encoded into the scripture when Moshe says, I want you to see something. Remember the questions. Why are you asking my name? Why are you asking my name? What is his name and what is his son's name? If you know it, you do know it. You will know it. Okay? So, and, and so, and then we'll get to, to the bigger part of Steve's question. But in this text, you're actually seeing the name of Yeshua associated with Yahweh. And it's the, it's the angel of Elohim. In this case, it does say the Malach Elohim, the Malach Elohim, the angel of God here. It's the same angel, though. Okay? Is coming around. He's moving around between the enemies. And he's standing there holding the Egyptians off. And it's the same one. At the same time, he's blowing the breath. You know? Okay. So, yes. This is the cloud. And here it's uh, Amud Ha'anan. A pillar. From the root word to stand tall. To stand up. Well, man means to stand up. So, it's a standing cloud. If you will. And that is Messiah. We have the benefit of hindsight. But again, what you're trying to show them is from their own text, from only the Tanakh, you have to be able to say this. And that's what we're saying, is that a moon is Yeshua. Okay? Uh, it changed into a pillar of fire, right? In the night time. Okay? And at the same time, it is called a rock. And I uh, can't remember if it's Selah or Tzur. I think it's Tzur in that next reference. Let's just go to chapter 15. And we looked at verse 2 of chapter 15 last week, right? Mm -hmm. Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua. Stand in the sense of plant your feet. 
And then he says, to Rehu et Yeshuaq Yahweh. So you'll see him again. You'll see the salvation of Yahweh again. Yeah. So that's kind of echoing the same thing that's going on in the Torah over in the book of Exodus. I was thinking it was in a song. This is the song of Moshe, if I remember correctly. Uh, and in verse 15, he says, But yes, your room waxed fat. And kick, you did wax fat. Though you, you did grow thick. You did become gross and heavy. Uh, and you forsook God who made him and contemned the rock. And that means to have contempt for. It's an old English way of saying it, or middle English way of saying it. Uh, contempt of the rock of his salvation. And so here that's Sur Yeshua Okay, so this goes with the rock statement that we have looking backward from the Brit Kadashah. Everybody understand what I said from using that language? We're looking back from the brief of Shah. We have, you have to remember, we have the benefit of hindsight and the rule of the Kodesh has revealed all of this to us, right? When you're approaching someone who may not see Yeshua and don't understand him yet and, and, and has basically been taught to reject him and they think he's not in the scriptures, what we're trying to do is show, show them that he is. And so you're building a case. So when, when you're a lawyer, how many of you have ever sat through a trial yourself, personally, in there, as a juror? Okay, then you know that it takes more than one piece of evidence to win the jury's mind, right? And, and the lawyer has to provide mounting evidence and, and hopefully irrefutable evidence, but it takes time to do that. And so you're not going to be able to go and show them Genesis 1 and show them the et thing and have them believe in Yeshua right away. You have to build your case. Right? And if we're talking just about the intellectual presentation of the data, then that's what we're doing. Then along with that, of course, you have to show them Yeshua yourself by being kind and being patient and, and having the ability to articulate these things without spitting in their face and getting all mad at them. Right? <laughs> so so, that, so there, it all goes together. But all I'm able to give you is hopefully on Shabbat, maybe give you some ability to transform yourself and then now give you the information that you need. So we're building our case here. And when you look at this, you're, you're seeing that he's talking about Israel. Does anybody know who remembers what Yeshurun means? It's a pet name for Israel. It's only used a couple of times in all of Scripture. And it, literally it means straight one. The one who walks a straight path. Yashar is the first three letters in it. And that means straight. Not turning to the right, not turning to the left, but walking straight. And so Yeshurun is a name that Yahweh calls Israel. It's kind of like a pet name. I call my son Jacob. I name that's his official name. My pet name for him is Jake or Jakey or something like that. Uh, so it, <clears throat> it's not a replacement name. It's just another thing that Yahweh calls them, and it means straight one. And he's telling them in this verse, you've waxed fat. And this is prophetic. Because at this point, they had not waxed fat. They were pretty much ready to go into the promised land. It was a new generation. This is right at the end of the 40 years. So it was a new generation. This is not the generation who had disobeyed so much and who had whined at, Mount, at, at Meribah and caused Moshe to strike the rock, which was Messiah, by the way. Uh, you know, this, this is not that generation. This is the one that is about to go across into the promised land. So this is a prophecy about them in the future getting fat and lazy in their faith and rejecting their salvation. Hmm. Rejecting Yeshua. Didn't they do that? Yes. So it was predicted that they would reject. 
inject tissue. Oh my gosh. Y'all don't see the impact of that? Every day I see it. You live with Jews. I mean, <laughs> I expect you to. <laughs> but you can show them, you know, that, that, that he knew that they were going to reject the person who would save them from their sin. Would it be beneficial to take a look at some of the reasons that they were seeing whatever they were seeing in the Tanakh that brought them away from Yeshua because of the arguments and figure out where to refute those. Yes, and we will hopefully do that. Uh, and that, that is the reason that I own a Tanakh. That is the reason that I read from a Jewish published Tanakh because you basically see their arguments in their translations of the English. Okay. Gotcha. So there are places that specifically talk directly about Yeshua, and they've gone in and tweaked the English. Now, again, they, they're, they're judicious over the Hebrew side. They don't mess with that. But they know, just like, just like we know, that most people don't, don't know the Hebrew, don't bother to read it, and don't care to research it when they are being taught something. They just accept what the teacher says. So they, for 2,000 years, they basically glossed over and hidden places in the Hebrew text, and we are going to go over that. They don't have an argument for this one because not a lot of, not a lot of Messianic people and not a lot of believers understand that this is a hint about Yeshua. His name is right there. All right? And he's telling them he's using a pet name for Israel, and he's telling them in your future, you're going to get lazy in your faith, build a fence around the faith. All right? That's lazy. Laziness, you're creating this little circle around it because you don't want to go in there and get into the nuts and bolts of the Torah. You don't want the people getting in there and getting into the nuts and bolts of the Torah. So they make the people lazy. They build a fence around the Torah and don't let them in there and look at it and study it. Doesn't it take more work to keep the lazy than it does to keep the keep? You and I know that. Okay. People who are rejecting truth <laughs> don't know that. Just checking. Uh, Yeshurun really waxed fat. You did kick. Okay, that means he's fighting against you. Remember what? You remember what Yeshua? And just keep this in the back of your mind. You remember what Yeshua told Shaul on the road to Damascus? Why are you kicking against the goats? And the goats is an allusion to the Torah. And there's a scripture in the Tanakh that basically tells you that the Torah is goats. And so. Shaul, being a doctor of, of Judaic theology and knowing the scriptures, you know, because he said he was above all the Pharisees, advanced well and well beyond everyone else in his, in his gift, in his teaching, he knew what, what linguistic link the Messiah, that's all Yeshua had to say to him. I guess we'll go ahead and do that one since I've already brought it up. It's in Ecclesiastes 12. Go to the man on Straight Street and he'll tell you what to do. So he preaches 
the gospel to do. But that was enough to catch that man's attention. So, <clears throat> and that, that's kind of the point I'm making about this verse over here. Yes, you read Because you're seeing that Yahweh is telling Israel. And again, you can go back to Psalm or Proverbs 30, verse 4. What is his name and what is his son's name? Who's gone up? Who's descended? What is his name? What is his son's name? Because you will know it. Or you do know it. Okay? And so we're looking back in the Torah and we're seeing that Yahweh said you're going to reject your Yeshua, the Yeshua of Yahweh. And if you preface your argument with the fact that you believe that Yahweh is Yeshua, and that any time you see Yahweh in the not, you're seeing Yeshua, and you're still having a conversation with him, that makes the impact of this verse a whole lot more powerful. If you can get him that far. You understand what I'm saying? I'll just see the board. I don't know what it is. The board is on there. It's been a long week. Uh, what's the Hebrew word for go? So that it's the same root as the bear. This is a song that David wrote. It's also in the Psalms. Okay, so some of what we're going to read here is also over in the book of Psalms. Because David wrote it, it's recorded in 2 Samuel, and then it's also recorded in the book of Psalms. Okay. Uh, and I, I can't remember which one it is. Uh, somebody will like, likely it'll ring a bell or you'll find it on your doodad. So just to show you it's a song you're familiar with, we're going to start in verse 20 or 47. Uh, we sing it all the time. Okay. So <clears throat> Yahweh lives and blessed be my rock. Exalted is the God, the rock of my salvation. Even the God that executes vengeance for me and brings down peoples under me. And that brings me forth from my enemies. You lift me up above them that rise up against me. You deliver me from the violent man. There I will give thanks unto you, O Yahweh, among the nations, and will sing praises unto your name. A tower of salvation is he to his king, and he shows mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. Migdol Yeshuot. 
Midon Yeshua, the Tower of Yeshua, if you will. In this case, I believe that's a plural Yeshua on the end. The Tower of Salvation. So it's plural there. But nonetheless, you see Yeshua's name right there in the Hebrew text. And this is, of course, and later in this study, we're going to start looking at actual messianic prophecies. And some of that, a big chunk of that is going to include all of the things that Yahweh said to David, because David is the one through whom the Messiah would come. And so many of the prophecies about Messiah were made directly to him. And so when he says here that you have become a, a power of salvation, you show mercy to your Mashiach. You show mercy to your Mashiach. Okay? It's in the possessive there. That's what that Bob is for on the end, is showing possession. Okay, you show mercy to your Mashiach. To David and his seed forevermore. So you're beginning to, to reach into the prophecies about the Messiah, and this is one, even though it's not a direct one, it's 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 more of a hint about Messiah than some of the other ones we've looked at already. The, the top, the top, when you said it was possessive, in this case, letter, in this case, it is. Possessive. Is that the letter or is that the context of the letter? That's the conjugation. It's the conjugation of the word. When you have a noun with a tab on the end of it, it means, you know, the book of whoever follows that word. Okay, so in this case, it's Yahweh. Yahweh follows this. So it's basically, this is kind of functioning a lot like this, pointing to the next word. Yeshua, the Yeshua of Yahweh. Okay, in this verse, it's Yeshua To, if I'm not Yeshua, and that's plural, the salvations. Okay, uh, but nonetheless, you see his name there. And you could say that that's a nail on a tree or on a, or on a cross, if you will, a stake, if you will. Because that, the top, you got to remember this letter here used to look like that. It used to look just like that. The, the original top looked like this. And it's, it was a... It was a mark, a signature. Oh, I just wanted to add a little to what you're saying about the last comment about the nail on the tree. But um, Shelly, a vow, cow, home vow, and cow, that's oat. That's the female plural name. But um, tab on the end of the like, now makes like it makes it all or something. Because in Malachi 4.4, one of the last things the late prophet said was on Zikru Torah Zikru Torah Moshe is more of love. Yeah. So what we have is two different things, and that's what I was writing as you began to speak. What we have is two different things. On this one, the top is pointing to the next person, the one who owns whatever this word is. So in Hebrew, Hebrew is different from English. So don't try to equate it to something in English. Let go of English. All right? And it, when I talk Hebrew, I talk, I told people to just do a brain dump. I don't want to hear your English. Just let go of it. If you're clinging to English trying to learn Hebrew, you're slowing yourself down. You've got a big old baggage of weight hanging around your neck. So forget that. In Hebrew... You have letters in front of the word and behind the word that are attached to the word that, that do different things. And what this one does, like he says, is it points to the fact that this is a noun belonging to somebody. And that, that somebody is whatever is after that top. Okay? In this case, it's two letters on the end of Yeshua, and I know that would be crazy there. It's two letters, the Vav and the Ted, the Ta. And that's Ot, which is a suffix that's kind of like our S. It makes it plural. OK? 
okay? Uh, but it's also got some mystery in it. A nail and a tree, a nail and a signature there, because above is a nail. Okay, so you have some mystical levels that are, you can play with when you're talking to your Jewish friends and throw it out there. I'd throw it all at them. It's their mystery. They're the ones that assign those meanings to those letters. And they should know if they, if they study Hebrew at all. So I'd throw it at them. Anybody that's done a study of the life of like Mordecai and David and, and people like that that like to get seriously into the Hebrew are going to be just eating it out. Mm -hmm. I see a hand going. I'm not an auctioneer, but it caught my eye. <laughs> Where were we? Daniel? It's possible for them to have. Uh, an approach from 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 Kabbalah. Say that again. I mean, the Jewish people. I mean, they can have a, an approach from Kabbalah, giving those uh, the, the the value you explained right now that is pointing out to Yahweh. Uh, it's Yeshua, Yeshua, right? Yeah. So it's pointing, yes, well, it's pointing to Yahweh. I mean, it's, you, you're saying that it's a it's, it's certain mysticism, mystery, and that. Okay, that, now let's qualify that before anybody freaks out and leaves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kabbalah is bad at a certain point. Okay? Yeshua taught Kabbalah. Yeshua taught things that are in the Zohar. He taught us mystery. He told us that there was that there was something to every yod and every tittle, every horn on the letter. So he told he tells us that there's a meaning behind all this stuff. I believe that's why he came when he did. Go back to Moshe, and there's some debate about what script was actually used. Okay, because this is the olive that we use, whereas the olive that some of the ancient used looked like an ox's head a little bit more obviously. They looked more, they were more picturesque in their depictions. And so this is the olive in the top there. This is the olive in the top. This is our olive and our top. So they look entirely different. Okay? But Yeshua came when this font although it's prettier now, this form was being used when he showed up. And all of these ideas about what the letters meant and what they represented had already been firmly established and were being studied diligently by Jews. Okay? So I believe that's why he showed up when he did, to sort of free Hebrew in that state and say, this is biblical Hebrew. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. Because there was some... I personally believe that Moshe used this too. But they found other types of script around there. Okay? But it doesn't matter because our text has this form and Yeshua approved of that text. And when he read the Bema, he was reading these letters. Okay? So I believe this is the one that matters to us the most. Okay? Your question, though, is about Kabbalah and the mystical... The things that we're seeing in the text that are not on the surface... Okay. <clears throat> Kabbalah has gone beyond what it was 2,000 years ago. It's turned into a new age type of religion. And that's bad. Yeah. But, what, but the, the symbols behind the letters is not bad. And I believe that Yeshua tells us that. I believe that's what he's talking about when he says, One yod will not pass away, not even one till or a stroke of a pen or however you look at it. Each, you know, this would be a. This is both a yod and a tittle, if you ask me, because and I'm not doing that the way it should have been done, probably. But this is it. I showed you this. This is a yod, this is a yod, and this is a box. But each of these is only a part of a letter, because it's the olive that we're, excuse me, that we're looking at. And I believe that's why Yeshua said not one yod. I believe he was even talking about the ones that hang off of olives. Okay? And so I believe he was telling us that everything about the Torah is important. Everything that has been inspired at this point was done by him. He put it in there. Okay? 
So, and when I say that Yeshua taught things that are in Kabbalah, what I'm talking about is the Zohar, which is the oldest written form of what that is now called Kabbalah. Okay? And if you look in there, you see things that are very similar to things that Yeshua said. Uh, and we don't have time to go over that, but... Uh, so, Jewish people know some of this stuff. The average Jew probably does not. Shelly, how, how much of this did you hear about when you were growing up? Probably not many. No. Okay? But someone who has been like the man that I met down in uh, the hotel, the, right next to my office, studying the Torah, I guarantee you he knows this stuff. He's been taught it. They, they dig and scratch in Hebrew, and they want to see Yahweh. They want to see. They do want to. They're looking for Messiah. They are. And they're reading the text trying to figure out who he is. And, and it's right in front of their face and they can't see it. And that's what we're trying to get is the information that we need to be able to show them. Look, I want to show you that Yeshua is Yahweh and Yahweh is Yeshua. And Yeshua is this guy in the brief shot. Mm -hmm. But you got to get the first part down first. Did I answer your questions? Yes. Uh, one, one more. Have you, have you ever spoken with one of those uh, Orthodox or Hasidic about this? Because this is... Not as much as I would like to. <laughs> yes, I have, but I've never been able to extend the conversation. And the, the friends they will I, understand this. Huh? They will understand They will understand it, yeah. And, and I believe that he is preparing this body for that. I believe that we're going to bump into them more and more. It might, be, um, it might be a wise thing to mention here for the people that are watching the video that are not here, though, that... Unless somebody is really, really grounded in Torah and had started their ministry at 30 and was in the priesthood and didn't, didn't, wasn't even shown to them until the age of 40, were they even considered ready for it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I drop a little snippets of this stuff on you, but I do expect you to be responsible with it. Uh, what he's talking about is Jews won't teach the higher level methods of study to just any Jew. And that's why Shelley didn't hear about it. They're not going to go to Hebrew school and teach 10-year-old boys all this stuff. Okay? Um, and it's their model is, and that's kind of our model, is, is that those who come and show themselves hungry for the learning, they're the ones that get drawn up into the higher levels of the teaching. Okay? And so they don't get to learn all of the depth of this stuff. We just happen to have some of the some of the rabbis wrote it down and they let their books loose and we got a hold of them. That's why that's why we have the information. So but so you have to be you don't just go around teaching this stuff to you know, because people will get irresponsible with it and go and, and it happens in the messianic community. They get irresponsible with it and they go and make up stuff about what the letters mean and and all of a sudden you got 94 with Kabbalah out there, and none of them are true. So you have to be careful with it. Uh, Did I send you to Chronicles yet? No. May I ask a question real quick? Sure. Are we still on 2251? Uh, well, I was just about to shift gears and go to another one. Did I send you to Chronicles yet? No. no. Uh, I just want to ask one, one que or the question about the fact that he was there. And this book, the word before that is in brackets. It means go. Uh, are the brackets in there in the Hebrew? Or is this just something that the stone edition put in there? Mine doesn't have brackets, so I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, it's just means go, which means tower. So go to. Chapter 16. 
16. And you're going to see again that this is a song. So he's learning that these songs are prophetic. And that the Messiah is kind of showing up in these things. First Chronicles chapter 16. Actually, I want to look at verse 22 first. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm backing up now to see how far back this song goes. This is David dancing before the ark. Okay, so this is pretty important. And when you get down to verse 23, it says, Shiru la yawa, kal ha'ar, basaru the yom la yom yeshuato. This is Psalm 96. The reason I know that is because I took that song and made a song out of it myself. We haven't sung it in a while, and I can't wait to get I like it. I don't know if everybody else likes it. But, uh, but I took these verses and made a song out of it myself. I put a melody to it. I didn't write the song, obviously. I just put a melody to it. But uh, here we have almost the same letters, but these two are reversed. And in this case, it's possession. It's that same possession, Shelley. But it's showing us who it belongs to, Yeshua Tov. That's telling us it's a male person, it's his. Okay? Yeshua Tov. Sing, uh, sing unto Yahweh a new song, sing unto Yahweh all the earth. Basaru uh, beyond the young Yeshua Tov. This is important, that Basaru there. Uh, that's the gospel. That's the Hebrew word for gospel. Basru. Uh, the gospel is besorah. So every word comes in Hebrew comes from a three-letter root. And you can show, you can tell your Jewish friends that you believe in the besorah. And they should know what that means. Good news. Okay? Well, here you have proclaim the good news of Yeshua to all the earth. That's basically what this verse is saying. So you have it, again, right there in their face, proclaiming His Yeshua to the whole world. Okay? Uh, and the word there is, so you could say, the gospel of Yeshua is right there in your face. It's right there in this verse. Basaru the Yom Yom Yeshua Okay? Okay? Basar... is the three-letter root, which means to tell. And if you put the hey on the end of it, that makes it a noun. Now it's besorah, which is good news. All right. And when we add that vav on the end of it, it's a verb in the plural, but it means you guys go and tell. Go and proclaim the good news. Basaru. Every day is Yeshua. I do. <laughs> Quite often in Hebrew, Hebrew poetry, there's like a
you see that Yahweh is the Alpha and Tav, you see, and you see that, someone find that. There's because there's a place in the Tanakh where Yahweh says, I am the first and the I'm the I'm the beginning and the end. I don't think he says he's the Alpha and the Tav, but I do know he says I am the first and the last and the end. Yeah. Yahweh says Pin it down and we'll look at it. Uh, so, <clears throat> so they understand that Yahweh is the beginning and the end, and they understand that the Alpha and the Tav are the first and the last letters of the alphabet. Okay, so then you're seeing that here. Recount among the nations the Alpha and the Tav, His glory. So Yeshua is the glory of Yahweh. Well, I was wondering, like the dual stands of poetry, out of Deuteronomy 32, the Psalm of Moses that we look at, yeah, I, I believe what he's doing is making sure that we understand exactly what it is that he's trying to get across, giving it to us in two different ways. So Basaru means to go out and tell, but Sakaru also means, uh, I believe, a hint about writing it down. And that may have been what compelled the apostles to write it down. They knew they were supposed to declare it, Basaru, but they also had to write it down, and they didn't do that for how many years before Matthew wrote the gospel down? But I think intuitively, through the Spirit, they knew, we got to write this down, because I, I think they figured out, he's not coming back before I die. So, uh, and of course, I believe the Ruach revealed to them that they were supposed to write it down, and, but I believe that this is a hint about that. Declare it, and, and declare it in two ways. Use your mouth, but write it down as well. And I'll tell you something about writing scriptures. It's good for you. You want a, a new hobby? You're bored? You don't have anything to do? Write the scriptures. It'll be a world of good. You'll be surprised. I'm talking with a pen. Yeah, I'm not talking about typing. I'm take a pen to paper and write the scriptures and see what happens. And it is kind of a command. It's a command. It's a command. It's a command to do it. The for the command king. to write the Torah, or to actually look at Deuteronomy. You know? For the king, it's two. Well, yeah. 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 That's right. Right. Yeah. Write it in Hebrew. That's right. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Write it in Hebrew. Write it in Hebrew. Write it in Hebrew. Write it in Hebrew. Basically, what he's saying here. 
Aharonim. Aharon means late or last. Okay. So Reshon is the is the ordinal letter, the ordinal word, our word first. You know what ordinal means? The numbers, putting the numbers in order: first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Reshon is ordinal. Okay. Uh, Aharon means last. And the other one was where? Forty-four. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer. This is good. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Yahweh Tzavot. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And here it just reads, Ani Rishon, Ba'ani Acharon. So this reads differently. This is better. This is the one that Yeshua quotes over in Revelation chapter 1. I am the first, and I am the last. And it's about four times in the book of Revelation. But what I want to show you is this is good, because you're talking about the Aleph and the top. You're talking about the first letter and the last letter, and you're trying to show people that this is Yahweh. And here you, he says it, and he says, and I am also your Redeemer. And of course, Yeshua is our Redeemer. Go I'm ignorant of the Hebrew here, but the way the English reads here, is he actually called the Redeemer? Yahweh of hosts? Uh-huh. Sure is. He says, Ko Amar Yahweh, Melech Israel. Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel. Ve'goelo Yahweh Tzavot. And his Redeemer, Yahweh Tzavot. It's two different people. Yeshua is Yahweh. It's Yahweh, the King of Israel. And it's Yahweh, the Redeemer. So it, it's a separation. His Redeemer. Okay? And His Redeemer is Yahweh to the hope. Now, I hope we have time to do it. Uh, because one, and I've taught this before. I've, I've used it in my messages many times. But when, when Yehoshua, you got to remember, back in Exodus 19, and we'll look at this again, I'm sure. In Exodus 19, Yahweh tells Moshe, the angel of Yahweh, my angel will go before you. We just looked just a few uh, chapters before that the angel was going before them, right? But here he's saying, when you go into the promised land, my angel is going before you. He tells Yehoshua the same exact thing. And so when Yehoshua the first, as soon as he gets across into the promised land, he gets the people over there, he's about to go up against Jericho, he sees this angel. And that angel calls himself Sar Yahweh Tevahot, the prince of the armies of Yahweh. What you got? Last week's Marshall, the servant Abraham tells his servant, Yahweh's angel will go before you. Yep. To find the Esau. That's right. The angel of Yahweh will go before you. Okay? So, <clears throat> so you have... So you have all of this mounting evidence about Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh. Okay, so Yahweh is, is Elohim Almighty sitting up on the throne, but he's, he's, he's manifesting a part of himself. The Word, His Word is manifesting in this angel over and over and over again. And the very first person that Yehoshua sees when he gets into the promised land is this angel standing there with a sword in his hand. And he ain't on nobody's side but Yahweh. So that verse is good. I've got to make a note of that. 44 6. Ko Amar Yahweh Melech Israel, the Goalo. Here's another little Hebrew lesson for you. Goalo. That Bob on the end is showing possession. He is redeemer. Goalo. I've used that before. I know that there's more than just one of Yahweh's story and family for what you do. That's right. The verse right before.
conversation we are, so I would have to do that. Um, but <clears throat> look at what he says in verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I will argue my way before him. This also shall be my Yeshua, that a hypocrite cannot come before him. Okay. <clears throat> Something that I found out after I became Messianic and began to study the Torah more and more is that Job is full of prophecies. And so I believe that in one way this is one of those. And uh, a hypocrite cannot come before it. I think that plays into Yeshua's trial a little bit. Yeah, he's a contemporary probably of Abraham somewhere way back in, in 
time. So there's a reason, you're going to see why I'm saying this, but there's a reason that I wanted you to get that chronology in your mind before we read what we're about to read, because especially given what we just read over in Exodus chapter 14 and 15. Okay. Now look at verse 15. Terrors are turned upon thee. They chase my honor as the wind, and my salvation passes away as a cloud. My Yeshua yeah. passes by as a cloud. Okay. That's not fully spelled there, however. I do need to point that out. That's missing the bottom. The verb. <coughs> Soundboards has like the screaming hawk on it. <laughs> I'll give you a little applause sign right here. Psalm <laughs> 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 3. What I want you to remember is.
say it like that. I mean, stop and meditate on this. But when I read that verse and saw that, that David, the person who the Messiah would come through, had people telling him that there is no salvation for him in God. You know, I've had people tell me that. I, my wife's ex-husband was one who told me that. When you stop hiding behind your God, you know, and basically implying that I was a coward. The man always wanted to fight him. Trust me, I always wanted to fight him too. <laughs> he wouldn't let me. When I, having people tell me that, uh, and then to read that verse and see Yeshua right there, and see that David went through the same thing. People close to him, that was his son. Realize that that's who he's writing about mm -hmm. The son of God can't save you. You know, son. Mm -hmm. It just did something for me. So right there in verse 3, you have Ain Yeshuata Lo. That top, this time it's a top and a head on the end. And that's telling you that it's it's his. There's not for him, a Yeshua for him. So it's possessive, but it's second person possessive, pointing at. You, you understand that? Ain Yeshua lo for him. Bel means Selah. And you could look at that next verse and say, magen I believe this is one of the reasons that the Magen David is called the Magen David, even though the original Magen was Abraham's. Okay? But this is where the idea of the shield of David comes in. And by the way, David's, if you use that other font, and it was used in Israel in the time of David, that's a dollar. Okay? And the tradition is, is that the shield of David was two dots facing each other. And it was the brace on the back of the shield. Whether or not that's true, we don't know because they were made of wood. They don't survive. There may be one petrified somewhere in water. That'd be nice to find. But uh, Yahweh is that shield. That's why I wear one. It's not, yes, pagans use the sign, but pagans also use the rainbow. Now what are we going to do? Cover up the rainbow every time we see one? You know, eradicate rainbows from the sky <laughs> just because people misuse the symbol. Uh, so that's why I wear a Magen David. There's other reasons. That's the argument that Christians will use on me every time I bring up their Christians. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same argument. And then I show them, after I show them this, then I show them the Rose of Sharon, which is an actual flower. And when it is in full bloom, looks exactly like this. So again, that means it even has this middle part. It has six petals that look exactly like that, and it has that little middle part. And then I'll show them the pomegranate flower, which when it's in full bloom, looks exactly the same way. Guess where the rose of Sharon grows? In Galilee. It grows in Galilee. And you'll find these flowers on archaeology to find out that the, the, and here's my favorite, I don't know why we're on this, but on the menorah. This would be the Mishnah side of Tanakh. At the top, they were told to put lily work under the bowls. So there was a bowl on the end of each branch. And under the branch, they were told to put a flower. It says flower in your translation, and from the Hebrew it is flower, but in the Aramaic carpels, it's lilies. And the lily looks just like this. And there's, we have, I have that linked. It's on the website. On the website, I think. There's a link to it on the website. So, and there's a picture of the flower. It's beautiful. They're all bright, shining, star day right there in that flower. And the pomegranate flower is the same one. It's beautiful. Uh, but the menorah is significant because... <clears throat> There's seven of those on the base of the menorah. So when you light them, what do you see on the floor? Six points, likely in the shape of a star. Okay. What did Yeshua say over in Revelation chapter one? I'm the one who walks among the menorot, the seven menorahs. I'm the one who walks among the menorahs, and I hold the star in my right hand. Okay. So. I don't have a problem with Magen David. That's 
especially since it, it, is, it was called the shield of Abraham and then David wrote about Yahweh being his Magen. Alright? This part of it, the fact that whether this was on the back of David's shield or not, I don't know. It makes sense. They say it was for bracing and that would certainly brace up a wooden shield pretty well. There's no way to prove that. There's no way to disprove it either. But the fact that Yahweh put it in the menorah, he also put it in the lily work of the the Bethany Gosh itself. And that is lilies. On the base of the columns at the top, on the, what do they call it in Corinthian? What do they call that? There's a name for that part of the column. The capital, yeah. Under that, put lily work. And of course, the lilies that they had to look at are six pointed. And you can see them in the Capernaum synagogue. There was, there was six pointed lilies there. In the Capernaum Synagogue, if you go to the Capernaum Synagogue, it's still there. It's, it's in ruins, obviously, but you can see the little ones. Okay, so that's why I don't have an issue with it. I don't know why we needed that sidebar, but there it is. Uh, thoughts, questions, or comments? Go down in that same song. It's not, well, it's, it doesn't come out quite. Yeah, it does. There are two, two places here. Okay, so in verse 8. Kuma, Yahweh, Hoshi, Enu, Elohai. Arise, O Yahweh, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies upon the cheek. You have broken the teeth of the wicked. La Yahweh HaYeshua. This one I love. La Yahweh HaYeshua. Unto Yahweh is the Yeshua. That's literally, literally what. What that is saying. Ha. That prefix, in this case, means the. So this is something other than just plain old salvation. This is specific salvation. And of course, I believe it's Yeshua. Yeshua belongs to Yahweh. Yeshua is for Yahweh. You can read it. Yeshua is Yahweh. <laughs> uh, so, ha Yeshua means no salvation. Now, is it now? Is it a feminine now? Yes. Yeah, remember it got converted to Yeshua when we went over here? Yeah, it's, it's in there. Uh, For one thing, this is just a poetic verse. I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> when you get fluent in Hebrew, you'll understand why that's so important. Uh, okay. The blessing will be upon your people. Okay, now this is where you get down into the depth of it. This is where you're borrowing from Galatians. Because Galatians chapter 3 tells us that the blessing of Abraham is upon those who trust in Messiah Yeshua. Okay, so Yeshua is the one who would bring the blessing of Abraham. What was the promise, the blessing to Abraham that Yahweh made? There's three places, Exodus I'm sorry, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17 is where you see the blessing meted out over a period of time. It, it's not just in one place. It's three different places, 12, 15, and 17. And that, so the whole promise to Abraham is in all of those chapters. And it starts with just, I'm going to make you your name great, I'm going to make you a, a mighty people, or something to that effect. And then he adds to it, he says, I'm going to bless you through... Your wife Sarah, and you're going to bear a son, and through him all the earth will be blessed, and your children will be like the stars of the sky, or something like that. And 17 carry it even a little further. And what I'm getting at is that Galatians calls that blessing the gospel. It tells us that the gospel was spoken to Abraham, the Besarah, that good news that we talked about before, was spoken to Abraham. When? Face to face. Several times. The last time being, I believe this is in 17, is when Yahweh shows up face to face. And remember when Yeshua says over in John chapter 8, we might have to segue off here and get into the Gospels. But Yeshua said, before Abraham was, I am. And he said, Abraham, Abraham saw my day. He met me. Okay? So Abraham saw Yeshua when? When Melchizedek appeared? 
And when the three men appeared to him at the tent of Mahomet. Okay? So, the Besorah is there. It was spoken to him. What is it? That all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. How is that blessed? You can't get a better blessing, I promise you, than having your sin, the guilt of your sin, lifted off of you. This is true. Can't get one better than that. And that is going to be on all people. That's what Yahweh said. He pointed out a while ago that salvation is for the nations. And one of the places we looked earlier, the next verse from the reference that I gave you said, salvation is for the goyim, the nations. It's for everybody. Okay? I think we're going to wrap up.
because of an agreement that I made with the Father of all the Jews, that, that if, you know, if you'll obey me, I'll bless you. Well, you didn't obey me, so I'm going to take the punishment on myself. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Anything else? Is that a question? I'm ready. I'm ready? <laughs> I'll be new about Our Father, our King, in the name of Messiah Yeshua, we give you thanks for your Torah. We ask you to help us to digest this and take in, into our souls only what is from you. Uh, reveal yourself to us and help us to reveal you more fully to those around us. We do pray that you give us an opportunity to minister to our Jewish friends. Uh, give us more uh, encounters with them and with members of, of the wider body of Messiah that we can uh, benefit them in some way, showing them your son, Messiah, Yeshua. Give us uh, not only the intellect we need, but the heart we need and the, and the kindness and mercy that we need for all people in the name of Yeshua. Bring us safety back on Shabbat. Amen. Amen.